Good evening and welcome. Thank you for coming tonight uh, to uh, this week's uh, constituent town hall. Uh, tonight we have a very special guest, uh, someone uh, whose name uh, most people did not know in January, but now uh, know very well uh, as we work our way through this pandemic. And I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing from her. I just want to provide just a couple updates for people. Uh, last week, we had a great meeting with over 75 people to talk about slow streets in uh, Pleasure Point. Um, we got a lot of great feedback from people and we put out a survey and I've been getting lots of additional feedback. I want people to know that we have not made any uh, definite decisions about what streets are gonna be covered in the slow streets program. Uh, so I appreciate it. People can still uh, go to the Facebook page and use the survey um, and uh, try to fill out information uh, so we can get uh, as much information as possible before we start that program. One of the things that we also heard from people, especially it came up during the meeting about what about 38th and 36th and 30th uh, streets uh, and how they might be impacted. Uh, 36th and 38th, we've talked with Public Works that if we were to move forward with a plan like this, uh, we would be able to reduce the speeds on those streets. 30th Avenue is a little bit harder. It does have a sidewalk and it already has speed bumps, so it's limited to what we could do. Um, also to be clear, uh, parking would still be allowed on all streets. We're just trying to slow the speed on streets. We're not blocking off the streets. Um, and we will be having a nomination uh, webpage uh, uh, through Bike Santa Cruz County to nominate other streets in uh, the district and uh, maybe throughout the county. Uh, and so we expect to have that up in the next couple of weeks and I'll put something in the newsletter when that happens. If you don't get my newsletter, I, uh, you can just type the word Leopold to 22828 uh, and that'll uh, get you uh, on the uh, newsletter list. Uh, and if you want daily updates about COVID or other county activities, I have a Facebook page, Supervisor John Leopold, and I try to post information there as often as I can uh, about uh, key issues that are affecting our community. I also just wanna add one other piece that we haven't talked about here, but happened at our last board meeting. Um, uh, the board took an important step at our last board meeting to A, place a, a moratorium on all new vacation rentals. So right now you could not get a vacation rental permit. And we, we not only capped the limit, but in Live Oak, we reduced the number uh, of vacation rentals. So we will start having less vacation rentals uh, over time. So I'm happy to talk about that issue tonight or any other uh, night. Um, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And if you have a question, uh, write it there and we'll be answering uh, that tonight. Um, and I think that'll work pretty well, uh, especially because we expect there'll be a lot of people. Uh, tonight we have Dr. Gail Knoll. Uh, Gail has been our health officer now for almost two years and uh, she's, and she's done uh, an amazing job uh, and she's been catapulted into the attention of everybody in Santa Cruz County uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. She has done an incredible job uh, as the architect of our strategy that has helped the transmission levels here be lower than other places. Tonight, we're gonna be talking about some of the most recent information, uh, which has been uh, different than what uh, we've been uh, for the last couple of months but her steady hand and thoughtfulness about using science and data to drive our decisions has been re real keys to our success. Uh, I'm glad that she's our health officer and I'm really glad she's here tonight to answer questions. Good evening, Dr. Noel. Thank you so much. I was going to say, uh, but I was muted, uh, that it feels like two years, but I've just uh, passed my one year anniversary as oh. health officer here in the county. So, and it's She's been a been great in the county longer, I think. <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, I, if it's agreeable with you, I'll start off with a review of the data. And so let's put a slide up and uh, go right into the data, the next one. And I hope that uh, most of you are familiar with uh, SantaCruzHealth.org, the website on which we display our data. 
It's uh, updated almost every day. We try to keep up with it. Um, sometimes we're short on staff or uh, have a glitch with the state website, but most of the time we're updating it on a daily basis. Um, and this is where you should be watching our total case count. So we have um, two dates since January or end of February when we had our first known case, 848 known reported cases of COVID-19. Um, that doesn't mean that that's all the cases that we have, that's what we know about. Um, and then uh, 511 of those are in the last two weeks. So you can see that over two thirds of our cases to date are in the last 14 days. So that's a strong indicator that we're headed into a surge. Um, 334 Santa Cruz County residents with COVID have recovered. And then we have reported three deaths. Um, we're very fortunate that we have a very low hospitalization and death rate, uh, especially compared to our neighboring counties and statewide. Um, if you look at the orange bar, the orange line on that epidemic curve, um, that is the most important place to look. And you can see the curve that we were talking about for months saying, let's keep that curve flat, let's keep it flat. And um, so you can see that it's no longer flat. We did a great job for six months of keeping the curve flat. And then uh, we've had a, a steady increase that indicates we're going into a surge. Um, the pie chart, um, half of that is gray under investigation. And that's because we're so um, backlogged, not backlogged per se, but of the, it takes about two weeks to do a full case investigation. And so um, the two weeks we have 500 new cases. So it's understandable that we have about uh, half of our cases under investigation. And, um, but of the cases we have investigated, we continue to see person to person spread through close contact as the most common form of spread. And then next slide will show the demographics. And although the virus started with a pretty even distribution throughout our county, um, it continues to now be heavily weighted towards South County. Um, there's a number of factors playing into this. We can talk about that some more. Um, but definitely Watsonville and the surrounding unincorporated areas are most impacted. And then um, significantly a growing uh, demographic is our 18 to 34 year olds um, holding uh, first place by far in uh, the number of cases, especially our new cases. Um, for a while we were seeing um, very prominent uh, Latin X as our um, main infected population but we're now starting to see um, more Caucasians in our recent cases, especially in that lower age group, still in the Watsonville area. And next slide. And this is my last slide, but I wanna show this to you. You can find this at santacruzhealth.org. And this is where you can follow the indicators that the state has set out for us um, that would trigger our um, economic dial back, um, dialing down the dimmer switch as the governor likes to say. And um, so you can see that we now have surpassed um, a couple of those triggers. And indeed we were notified by the state this afternoon, just a couple of hours ago, that we are now officially flagged in their data monitoring system. So um, we are expecting in about a week to 10 days to have some new orders in place with some further restrictions. And that's it for my slides. And i um, happy to take questions unless you'd like to make some more comments. No, I really appreciate it. And I encourage people to check out the county website, santacruzhealth.org slash coronavirus. Uh, there's been some updates to the website, uh, some new uh, uh, tabs, uh, so it's easier to get to all the information. And it doesn't say it very clearly, but if you right click on any of the charts, you can get even more information. And I encourage people to check that out. It, it has a lot of information um, it, and it also gives you some sense of where we're going. It has, it has some modeling about what we would expect. And I'm sure we'll talk about that here this evening. 
Uh, Dr. Newell, I was wondering if you could talk about our testing capacity and sort of what are our challenges with testing right now? It feels like testing has been our big uh, difficult point since the very beginning. If you all remember, um, the only way we could get a test back in January and February was to call the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia and plead our case. And it, in some ways, it almost feels that we're back in that same situation now. Um, the current shortage, the scarcity of resource has to do with reagents that are required to actually run the test. So we now finally have enough swabs, we have enough viral transport medium to collect the specimen, and we have the equipment, but it takes certain kinds of chemicals in order to run the test themselves. And there's a global shortage of those chemicals that has played out across the US, uh, across our state and in the county of Santa Cruz. And that's what's causing the long delays in uh, turnaround times on our test results from commercial labs through the OptumServe site and other sites. Um, so I, we are very, very fortunate though because we have um, UC Santa Cruz here in our community and they have an active genomics lab and we have a partnership with them and they have agreed to um, expand their current capacity, which is at about 150 tests per day. And um, they think they can go up to 900 tests per day or more if they have additional equipment. And so with your approval and the other supervisors, we've been able to direct um, close to a million dollars of CARES Act funding uh, to purchase more equipment for UC Santa Cruz. Um, so that's what uh, the county is making that partnership. Sure. And because of that, we'll have a preferential status with the genomics lab at UC Santa Cruz to be able to do our testing there. So in the coming weeks, we hope shortly, we'll have much better testing capacity within our community. And we'll, we'll have a lot more control over it. It'll be, everything will be here in the county. We won't have to, we don't have to wait on someone else um, with this setup. Exactly. So um, right now, for example, our Ramsey Park site in Watsonville, where folks can go for free testing, um, it's really not of much value now because it takes about three weeks to get an appointment there now. And uh, with a turnaround time of about 10 days, and so that's of no value to us to find out, you know, if someone's positive after they've been exposed. By that time, they've already exposed four more, you know, generations of incubation. So this is going to be so much better. Yeah, well, that's great. And it's great that we have that partnership. I know they've been with us uh, since the beginning, but uh, using CARES Act funding to, to pay for equipment to build the capacity here and having control here in Santa Cruz will, will, will allows us uh, to ensure that we can meet the needs of our community and doesn't have to depend on the state or federal government. Um, I want, want, you, want you to know, uh, I wanted you to talk about a little bit about transmission and what we're seeing here in Santa Cruz. There's a lot of, you mentioned the South County, you mentioned the young people. Um, and so uh, what have we found in our investigations about how they have contracted the virus? Yeah, so if you remember at the beginning, there was a lot of concern about countertops and the boxes that might get delivered from Amazon and the things you bring home from the grocery store. And it turns out, we know a lot more about the virus now than we used to, and it turns out that um, it's really hard to get COVID from an inanimate object. Right. Um, it's hard to get COVID outdoors as well under most circumstances. So almost always COVID is transmitted it between in close contact. So being within six feet of someone for over 15 minutes. Um, it, and it's pretty hard to get it even in a work site in a retail store or anywhere. So when we're doing our case investigations, even if we find multiple cases in a particular work site, it turns out that it's uh, most likely that those employees got it when they were out having a drink after work or um, uh, some of them live together, some of them socialize together. So 
or the break room is another big problem where everyone takes off their face coverings to eat and drink and hang out in the break room and they kind of forget all those precautions there. Well, and uh, when we see young people, that's something that we've seen not only here in Santa Cruz, but in uh, a, across the state and across the country. Um, it, it, do health, officer, health officers talk about this? And do we, do we, are, are you thinking about strategies about how we can reach them? Right, so um, yeah, I've got a couple of young adults, uh, children living with me at home now, and I can say that um, we're all a little tired of living together, and um, especially those young folks, they're tired of being with their parents only and hanging out with their parents. Sure. Um, it might have been fun for a while, but now they want to be out with their friends, and um, so that, I think that explains the age group. Um, it's those gatherings outside of the household unit that really put us all at risk. And not just of, of young people, but the multi-generation, multi-household gatherings that happened with the holidays, with graduation, Mother's Day. Um, those have been the primary places that this has spread in our community and across the state. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it turns out that we all have control here. Our, our our personal actions affect not only ourselves, but the entire community. And whether that's wearing a mask or whether it's keeping six feet away from people and not engaging in these uh, family and friends groups that feel safe but aren't safe uh, can really make a difference here in Santa Cruz. Exactly. And this point was really driven home to me this week. Um, I was listening. I try to keep up with the, the science and medicine of this disease. And one of the ways I do that is to listen to the grand rounds from uh, University of California at San Francisco. And they had a panel um, of experts this past week um, who cited studies from the CDC and elsewhere. And they agreed that if we would all do those individual behaviors that we've talked about from the beginning, um, staying home when you're sick, physically distancing six feet apart, um, not gathering outside of your household unit, this whole pandemic would be over in four to six weeks. We'd be done as a nation. And it, it seems so simple. I know it's not. Um, but um, it is those individual behaviors that determine our community outcomes. Well, the, 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 the people assign a great deal of power to you. They, they, they look for me to make decisions, but it's really what people do in their homes, in their backyards, uh, when they're out, that's really is the powerful tool here, it seems like. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, hospitalizations. You know, we, we've seen a relatively low level of death in the county and, and our hospitalization rate is ticking up, but it's, it hasn't been uh, overwhelming. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that and where do you think it's gonna go? Yeah, it's really interesting. This, this is another topic that's often talked about among the health officers when we have statewide gatherings and regional gatherings. And it's also a topic at the CDC because this is a noticeable trend um, all across the country as this disease has progressed that hospitalizations and deaths are decreasing. It may be because we know more about how to treat the virus, we understand it better, and we're catching um, sick, vulnerable people earlier so we can watch them more closely. But there is another theory that um, just by wearing face coverings, it's possible that when people do get sick, they're getting sick on a smaller inoculum. So fewer strands of virus are actually getting inhaled um, in, through the air, um, both by the mask wearer and because of the other person wearing the mask. And because they're getting a lower inoculum, a lower dose of that virus to start, that perhaps people are not getting as sick. So um, another um, theory about why face coverings might be as effective as they're proven to be. Yeah, well, I know it's something that we're watching very carefully about our hospitalization, our capacities. And we all say that we love first responders and they've been working pretty hard for the last four months. And, um, and right now we're, we're at one of the higher levels, but we're still under 20, which is, you know, our goal. Uh, and if you really care about those first responders, wear the face covering. Um, next week, 
on on my town hall meeting, I'm going to have the superintendents of some of our local schools, Live Oak, it's Oakell, hopefully Santa Cruz High, sort of talk about what the school year is going to look like. Could you tell uh, uh, people a little bit about what your role is in the uh, the questions of school openings and 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 what they look what they would look like? Uh, because I think people think that you have more power than you do. <laughs> I know I did a radio interview a couple of weeks ago and the um, person on the radio said, you're the most powerful woman in Santa Cruz. How does that feel? And I said, perhaps the most notorious, but <laughs> certainly not the most powerful. <laughs> um, yeah, so it turns out that I don't have a very big role to play in those decisions. There was some question about that at the beginning because of the way some of the trailer bill funding was uh, worded. Um, in the document, but um, in the end, uh, my role is to provide guidance to the local county office of education and the superintendents um, of the various districts throughout our county. And so I'm very comfortable with that role, providing guidance and letting them make the decisions about what's best for our children from an education point of view and developmental, because that's certainly not my area of expertise. Sure. Um, I'm an obstetrician by career, so I know a lot about bringing babies into the world, but after that, it's definitely not my, my area of expertise, so I'll leave that up to the educators. Exactly right, exactly right. Well, and, and, I'm, and we'll get more information next week about what it's going to look like in our community, and I encourage people to, to come back next Wednesday at six o'clock to hear about Live Oak and SoCal Schools, hopefully Santa Cruz High. Uh, we've gotten a number of questions. We've covered some of them, but I, but I just want to uh, uh, try to see if we can get to some of these. Um, uh, Thelma writes in that our pediatrician said asymptomatic testing has a higher false negative rate, and so it doesn't offer much value. Any chance you could comment on testing accuracy and confidence that we could have in the, in the testing? Yeah, so generally um, our tests, it, it varies a little bit by which testing platform is done and um, how the testing, the specimen is collected and by whom. Um, but generally they're very high, both in specificity and sensitivity, which means they, they're good at picking up both false positives and false, I mean, true positives, while um, having a small number of false negatives. But it's true that the more asymptomatic people we test, the more, that means we're testing fewer sick people so a place like OptumServe, which means you're, you're more likely to have both false negatives and false positives. Sure. So there's a couple questions here about the state monitoring list and why things are open or not. So the, the, um, uh, someone asked here, if, we're, if we know we're getting on the monitoring list and things are going to close down, why are we waiting? Yeah. So. Um, you know, I've, I've had this difficult task of walking this tightrope between um, trying to protect the safety and health of our community members and at the same time allow them to get back to work and get our economy rolling again. And um, the, the governor's reopening um, was um, too fast. Uh, I think even he would agree about that at this point. It confused a lot of the public and made people feel that the worst was over and it was party time. And um, especially the areas around um, opening to tourism, which sent a message that travel was okay, even though there's still a stay at home order in place. So those are really contradictory messages and um, they're confusing to the public. Um, but as we move forward and have learned more about this virus, I really believe that it's not additional orders that are going to make any difference in our uh, outcomes in our community. It's really about those individual behaviors. And um, if closures can help remind people that that's what's important, that would be good. Um, and it might incentivize people to follow those behaviors better. But um, I don't think that closures and additional orders are really the answer. Yeah, this is the tough thing about public health, uh, is that public health uh, practitioners are always asking us to do things we don't want to do, but are good for us. You know, <laughs> uh, wear a condom when you, when you uh, have sex, uh, 
exercise more, eat right. Uh, <laughs> these are the tough things. And now we're asking you to not be in contact with your friends, wear a face covering. And so it's uh, public health is so much about behavior change and it's tough to just mandate behavior change. People have to assimilate it, understand it's a way of life and then make it part of uh, your life uh, because it's, uh, it's um, even if we have more fines and fees and everything else, um, it's till people change the way that they live um, is, is, is the thing that's gonna help us defeat this virus. Someone asked here about the number of cases arising for children under 17. Are we seeing any serious illness in this group or is it primarily asymptomatic? It's primarily asymptomatic and most of those are um, being tested at OptumServe or as contacts within households. So they wouldn't have known that they were sick except that they became sick. Uh, I mean, they were tested at the yep. time of other household members getting tested. Um, so we've been very fortunate that we haven't had very ill children because there is a rare um, inflammatory syndrome that children can get um, that's similar to Rye's syndrome. And um, it has lifelong consequences. So we haven't had anything like that in our community. The other children we worry about are newborns because it turns out, um, unlike what we thought at the beginning, that there probably is some transmission through the placenta from mom to baby, or there can be, and also that babies can more easily get infected by their parents, their families, their loved ones um, sure. in those early weeks of life. And so um, we did, we have had some newborns hospitalized with COVID, but fortunately they've all recovered well. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's scary when you think about entering this world at the, and already being sick when you get here. So it becomes super important. Um, yes, Denise is asking, have we had any positive tests in our jails? We have had, um, I'm giving you a sneak peek before our press conference tomorrow. Okay. We had um, one inmate um, who tested positive at the jail on arrival. So that was on intake. And that inmate had been um, not in our county prior to the time he drove in and turned himself in. And so um, we are not worried about exposures in the county from him. And then we have had some correctional staff test positive as well, but no outbreaks at all. Yeah, and, and they're, they've set up some protocols at the jail in order to help uh, prevent the spread. Uh, do you feel comfortable talking about what some of those protocols are? Do you yeah, so I, I want to commend our sheriff because and jail commander because very early on, as soon as we knew about this in January, we started talking about um, how to prevent outbreaks in our jail, our adult detention facilities, all of them. And um, so we um, put measures in place that decreased the jail census dramatically. Um, and the DA signed off on those as well. And then um, right, on, right off the bat, we restricted visitors to the detention facilities as well. So um, the only visitors that have been allowed in for the past six months have been those that are required by law, so legal and clergy and um, healthcare. Um, so very limited. And then um, uh, we have been quarantining every new intake um, person um, prior for 14 days in their own cell prior to entering into general population and they also got get screened twice a day and now we've instituted testing in that population as well so they get tested on intake again at 12 days with a negative test required before they go out into general population. Uh, yeah I, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness that went into coming up with those protocols. I, I think the early action by your staff around our skilled nursing facilities has also yielded great results and we have not seen the, um, the spread of death that we've seen in skilled nursing facilities throughout the country. Uh, we can be very grateful for that here in Santa Cruz. So uh, it's forward thinking by you and the sheriff and others that have really prevented a real public health uh, tragedy here in Santa Cruz County. Um, this is a question from James, the a question about public transit and about what people should do when they're on the bus. 
Um, and should they stay away from the drivers, stay away from the other people? Is it safe? So the governor put out uh, public transit guidance very early in his industry guidance, recognize, recognizing that um, many of our community members rely on public transit for their transportation needs. And that especially our essential workforce, absolutely critical um, that they have uh, public transit available. And so uh, he made accommodations from the beginning, um, recognizing that it wouldn't always be possible to maintain six feet of distance physically when on public transit. Um, so then it's common sense and uh, wear your face coverings. Everyone needs to be wearing their face coverings on public transit and um, use your, wash your hands before and after and cough into your, your um, elbow instead of out into the public. And if you're able to maintain six feet of dis distance, that's preferable. Great, thank you. I know that's been a, a, a hotly de debated topic and uh, appreciate your helpfulness. Um, this is a question I get asked a lot about, will we gonna re reconsider uh, uh, the beaches and closing the beaches, keeping them open? Um, increased tourism puts additional burdens on the low wage workers, primarily from South County. And could that be a contributor uh, to what's going on? Yeah, first of all, I wanna clear up any misunderstanding there might be about the beaches. The beaches themselves and the ocean are not a risk for COVID-19. So I want you to get out there and enjoy them, be active on the beach. Um, being at the beach, especially if you're physically active, is um, very rejuvenating for your body and your spirit. And I encourage everyone to take advantage of uh, the beaches and our beautiful parks. Um, it's one of the reasons we live here in this county. And um, so it's good for your health. So that right off the bat. Um, and then, um, so the reason that we closed the beaches for a few hours a day was to disincentivize tourism. So we were trying to discourage our neighboring county folks, especially when their beaches were closed, um, from coming to our beaches and crowding our beaches and um, being out in our public spaces and in, in our stores and restaurants and, and not having the same kind of um, investment in the community. So if they're not from our community, perhaps they're not as interested in those behaviors we talked about that might protect community members. Um, and I saw that play out when I'd be out and about in the community. So um, I think it was valuable and um, it became a kind of a difficult point though after the governor started promoting tourism and travel and allowing tourists in our hotels and short-term vacation rentals um, because that really was sending a confusing message to the public and to our neighboring counties. Yeah, and so it's something we talk about all the time uh, still. And uh, I know some of us have been in contact with the governor's office and the health director to talk about whether there could be some state actions, uh, Disney World or Disneyland being open. And it, it doesn't seem like a great idea. Um, there's a question here that's related to the monitoring list. And I just want to talk about that a little bit more about what that means and when it will happen. Um, you mentioned something like a week till we get to the, the sort of the second stage of the governor's list, which is closing down indoor activities such as religious services, gyms, um, and barbershops, uh, hairstyling. Uh, so could you just walk through that process and if I missed anything that we're, that it's going to be closed uh, to, to share that with folks? Yeah, sure. It's a complicated process. I'm learning as I go too, but I did get clarification today from the state. Um, so we were notified just this afternoon, as I mentioned, that we were flagged. And what that means for those of you that have been following the county data monitoring list, that um, one of our black check marks on that list, which is a good thing to have a black check mark, means you're meeting the, the goals. Um, but one of those was triggered, and that was our case rate. And so that will show up starting today as a blue number instead of a black check. And that indicates that we're flagged. And when we're flagged for three days in a row, then we have engagement with the state. Now, most of the state is already engaged with the 
state, most of the health officers. So it's definitely not onerous. Um, and what they want to help us do is look at ways that we might uh, be able to impact our rate. So for example, in Kings County, they worked with skilled nursing facilities. In Imperial County, it was border control issues. In Kern County, it's been meat packing plants. Santa Cruz, um, there's not a lot that's outstanding that we could do differently. We're just joining the surge that's happening across the state, um, but they will engage with us. And then for three days, we'll be on the monitoring list. And um, so three days flagged, then three days on the monitoring list, and then they will tell us, they will direct us to um, play, put orders in place that will restrict those. And I'm going to ask the state health officer to put those in place for us. That will take another two or three days um, for that to happen and go into effect. So about, I'm, I'm guessing 10 days from now, we'll have our economy dialed back and we'll need to close down the indoor operations you mentioned. So um, you were right on this. So religious and cultural services, including wedding ceremonies and funerals will need to be moved outdoors as and protests need to stay outdoors. Um, offices, office work um, will need to be disbanded. So go virtual again. Um, for non-essential office work. Um, gyms and fitness centers, they can have classes or services outdoors, but not indoors. Um, barber shops and hair salons. So um, in anticipation, I went and got my hair cut pretty short because I know it's gonna be a while till I can get it cut again. So you've got a week to get to the barber shop for those of you that need haircuts. And um, uh, personal services like facials, massage, tattoos, um, those kinds of things all need to move outdoors. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's definitely going to be a change. And then it will be on that for at least three weeks, at the very least. That's the requirement. Yes. And also malls. So the, um, any stores in the mall that have an outdoor a door can continue to do retail, but the mall itself will be closed. But indoor retail establishments will still be open? Yes, and manufacturing as well. Right. Um, so the, the, the question here about swimming, and uh, 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 right now they're limited to uh, only one person per lane, and um, would they be able to remain open for outdoor lap swimming uh, with more local restrictions? There's no additional local restrictions. It's uh, unless they're put in place by the facility themselves. So you refer to the governor's guidance and the pools are a little confusing because they're found in three places. The pool guidance, it's found in uh, the gyms and fitness center guidance. It's found in the camping and outdoor recreation guidance. Oh, and they just added it to schools guidance as well, or they will tomorrow, I believe. And um, there's one other place, but um, there's, uh, there, the guidance is all there. Yeah, I know, and, and we're such an outdoor recreation uh, community that uh, not being able to use our pools as fully as we'd like is, is can be really frustrating, but obviously the congregation of people that uh, is the greatest concern there. Um, so someone has been looking closely at our, our, uh, um, our testing and noticed that the testing, the number of tests per day have gone down. Could you explain a little bit about why that's happening? Yeah, so it has to do uh, exactly with the testing uh, scarcity because of the reagent scarcity globally. And so uh, people just can't, there's not capacity to get tested. So, for example, the healthcare systems are no longer willing to test people unless they're symptomatic. So they have to be pretty sick in order to get tested. The hospitals have people backed up uh, waiting to be seen and they're unable to get rapid results. Um, so it's really impacting every healthcare system. Um, we've been working to do surveillance testing in the skilled nursing facilities and that has, um, uh, we haven't been able to do that because of the um, testing scarcity. And then even OptumServe itself has cut back on the number of uh, specimens they collect per day. It's amazing. And I've noticed that the, the percentage of uh, the Latinx community 
that has is it's moving up and down. Uh, at one point, it was it was all the way up, I think, to 55 percent. Now it's, it's just under 50 percent. Um, you have a sense of why why we're seeing that kind of movement. Um, we're definitely seeing more Caucasians impacted in the Watsonville community. So um, I think it's just continued spread through gatherings um, and uh, work workplaces, um, specifically in you know gatherings around workplaces. So um, moving out of you know spreading more broadly in the Watsonville community. So we have a couple of questions that may be less for you and more for, uh, for me uh, about enforcement um, uh, on, uh, you had mentioned that the risk of transmission on the beaches is pretty low. Um, and that's why we had the, the beach closures was there to discourage the visitors. And so we aren't uh, enforcing on the beaches uh, right now about the six foot. Um, but I get this a lot because we're seeing this across the state about the uh, addition of fines for people not wearing face coverings um, and uh, other violations of the stay at home or the shelter in place order. And I know that uh, some of us have talked with our county administrative officer and I expect at the next board meeting that we will take some action to uh, add fines for some of these activities and increase the number of people who could actually um, uh, assess those fines because uh, one of the, the, the challenges is, is our, our deputies are, um, they're spread pretty thin to begin with and we need to have other people who could do it rather than calling the, the sheriff's office each time. Mm -hmm. I will say that if people do have, if they see businesses that are acting uh, not according to the standards, you can call the sheriff's office. They will go visit them. They're committed to that. Um, but it's hard to, there's a lot of personal activity that it's hard for them to stop each and every one. We don't have enough officers for that. Uh, but we are gonna be looking at some additional fines. Um, there's a question here about contact tracers and uh, is uh, uh, the, someone said they heard that Dr. Galley say he had a lot of contact tracers who could help, but they need to be integrated into county teams. Uh, is that integration going on locally? Is it really available uh, to us? And maybe more importantly, how many contact tracers do we have? Yeah, we have, um, currently we have 21 seasoned, experienced contact tracers and case investigators. And we've hired an additional 29. And that includes uh, four employees that we got from the state, um, from that task force that uh, Secretary Gali was referring to. And um, those new, uh, that new group is being integrated into our current communicable disease unit. They're being onboarded onto CalConnect, uh, which is the new state software for the platform uh, for contact tracing and case investigation. Um, and they're all working at home. So um, to get them all onboarded and get everybody their uh, laptops and cell phones they need has been uh, quite a chore through the county government, as you can imagine, um, but we're getting there. So uh, we're adequately staffed at this point. Great, and, and it's, it's tough to do a lot of contact tracing when we have this, the number of cases turning positive all at one time. So again, that's where the personal action to reduce that so we can more effectively contain this will become very important. Um, early on in the pandemic, we talked a lot about uh, lack of supplies for PPE. Uh, could you weigh in now? Where are we with our supply? Do we feel like we have enough? Do we need more? Um, should we be concerned about that? We're good on PPE. That's one of the benefits of having this surge put off for six months like we did is um, not only do we know more about the virus, but we're better, better prepared to deal with it. And PPE is one of our big successes. So occasionally we have a shortage of one type of PPE or another that we need to address, but we're, we're set at this point. And the governor just announced today uh, a new supply of something like 120 million N95 masks. Hopefully they'll actually get here and they'll work this time. <laughs> That's right. Um, so here's an interesting question uh, put forward by Stephen. Uh, you mentioned that it's difficult to get the virus outside. So what's the harm of people gathering together? outdoors? 
Yeah, it's uh, if people would stay six feet apart and wear their masks, um, they probably, their face coverings, they probably would be just fine. The chances of transmission then, especially if they're active outdoors, is very small. Um, the problem is, is when people are sitting very close together, sharing food, um, having intimate contact, um, all of those things put people at risk. Um, if they're with members outside your own household unit. Yeah, we've seen ac across the country that people think, well, my group is fine because they've all been sheltering in place. So we're, there's low risk. And then and when you have 20 people in your backyard, you can't monitor everybody and it's easy for someone to slip. And then, the, you know, you wake up one day and 12 of the people have, have a COVID diagnosis. So uh, that's what we've seen so far, correct? Right, and it's really hard because at least 40% of cases are asymptomatic. They never get ill. So especially in the younger group, that 18 to 34, they may never even know they have this disease. And so they feel fine, so they think they're healthy and um, unknowingly spread the disease to their friends and family. Um, so a question here is about the skilled nursing facility and care homes. We talked about a little bit um, what are we doing to uh, protect the safety of folks in skilled nursing facilities and uh, how that's led to our good success? Yeah, so there's both state and local orders in place to protect our, our uh, elderly in the skilled nursing facilities. And um, early on, uh, I've made a health officer order to restrict visitors and then the state put one in place as well. And um, that has really helped. And um, then we've worked very closely with all seven of our skilled nursing facilities in the county to prepare and be ready for when they do have a case. So um, we've done drills, we've trained them on how to respond. Um, our staff have been on site at their, their sites. And um, we have had uh, uh, cases in five of our seven skilled nursing facilities but we've reacted very quickly and have uh, prevented any significant outbreaks or clusters. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And when we see the stories all over the country, it really highlights one of the, the great successes we've had here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, Joanna is, uh, is concerned about language here. I, I use the word face coverings. She says that bandanas don't work that well. Um, They're too porous. So shouldn't we be saying mask? Is, you know, what, you, what, what, how should we be talking about uh, what we cover our face with and are there things that are better or worse or, you know? Yes, um, medical grade masks are definitely better at preventing illness to the wearer. So, um, but we don't want a shortage to take place when our healthcare or frontline workers um, need to have a medical grade mask on. And so it would be um, indeed fantastic if we had enough medical grade masks for everyone to be able to wear one and toss it every time they um, are done with one. Um, but we just don't have that kind of supply at this point. And so we're still trying to avoid the word mask when we're talking about public use and use the word face covering. Um, multiple layers of cloth um, in a folded fashion, like you've seen those accordion kind of face masks sure. or something similar are, are pretty effective. They're very effective for the people you're with, not as effective to the wearer. Um, so uh, definitely just in, even if you don't have access to a medical grade mask, um, face coverings are far better than not wearing anything at all. So please, please keep wearing your face coverings. Thank you for that clarification too. Um, so we, a question that again, not for you. So uh, the, you get to have a little break. Uh, the, the, the Wendy writes that last year when we had the PG&E uh, public safety power shut off, uh, communication companies were not prepared for emergency backup power uh, with, uh, with repeat uh, emergency backup power for towers and repeaters. Uh, they're up near the summit and on, they were for seven hours on a red flag day, they had no way to communicate to the outside world. Are we aware of the problem? And is anyone working with communications companies to address this problem? Uh, especially now that so many of us are working from home. And I know 
that uh, our staff has been in contact with Verizon and Comcast, and those companies are have been working to put power supplies. Um, there is new legislation that was passed by uh, up in Sacramento that requires this on lots of new uh, equipment. Uh, and we've been working to make sure that that uh, can stay up during uh, a public safety power shutoff. Um, it, it may not be as strong or last as long as we hope, but we don't want to have a repeat of what happened last year. Uh, if there's a particular area that you're interested in, contact my office and we can, I can find out for sure that those, air, those that, that equipment has been backed up uh, and, and tell you directly. Um, another question from Elaine says, it seems that many more people are traveling, flying, going out of state. Uh, are you worried about that? And is that a good idea for people here in Santa Cruz? I'm really worried about that. And that is not a good idea. So um, just a reminder that the governor's stay at home order is still in place. We're still to avoid non-essential travel. I'm not sure how tourism fits into that picture, but uh, <laughs> it probably shouldn't. And um, we are still at public health recommending that if you travel out of state um, or on a, an airplane trip that's um, longer than uh, an hour that you quarantine for 14 days upon your return from to home in Santa Cruz County. Yeah, the more people move around, the harder it is uh, for us to uh, keep control. And uh, I've talked to some people, I talked to someone today who drove to Oklahoma and they said it was so scary even driving, uh, the number of places they had to go and the different practices that people had. Uh, that um, they were worried about flying and driving is, is just as bad. So uh, we're safer here in Santa Cruz and we could keep the community safe if people stay uh, close to home. Um, there's a question about dental offices. Are they gonna be allowed to be open? Uh, they're allowed to be open now. If we on this monitoring list, are they allowed to be open? They are healthcare facilities, um, all of them, including dental. Uh, will continue um, as long as we have adequate PPE. So for dentists especially, um, the cleaning and is aerosolizing, cleaning and drilling um, aerosolizes the virus. So the dentists, hygienists, and any staff in the room all need to be wearing N95 masks, sure. and they need to have enough to do that um, patient after patient all day. And so um, that's a really important point. Um, and then uh, the other thing is, is that if we come up against hospital capacity issues, we might have to start um, limiting or eliminating for now elective surgeries and non-emergent surgeries and procedures. Yeah, we all wanna not get there, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, 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 Deborah uh, asks, uh, have we detected any COVID cases among restaurant and bar workers and what's the protocol for dealing with this? And I think it's a, it's a good time to talk about uh, the new part of our website that talks about employers and the role that employers can play uh, in helping us track this virus. Yeah, so in recognition uh, of the fact, and it is a fact that we can no longer contact every single person with a positive COVID test, and do contact tracing and case investigation. We're asking employers to step up and do their part. So if they have a case or an exposure in their work site, um, we're going to be asking them to develop their own line list of contacts and case exposures and um, provide us with that information. And once they have three or more cases, um, we will uh, start actively working with them um, to prevent any outbreaks or clusters um, spreading, becoming bigger or spreading beyond their workplace. Again, though, most of the cases, and there have been um, some restaurant workers I know of for sure that have tested positive, but most of those, it, their exposure has not been at work, or if it's been at work, it's been in the break room or socializing with other employees. Yeah, uh, it's important the role that employers can play and the information that we have on the website now is very, very useful. So if you 
or someone that employs other people and as a workplace, I encourage you to take a look at it or share it with your employer uh, because uh, we're, we're all in this together. And if we can identify people who are sick uh, before they get to others, that can make a big difference in us uh, slowing the spread again here in Santa Cruz. Um, so here's a question from Sherry that, that public health uh, folks get uh, asked probably a lot. Um, we talked about it a little bit is if people have been uh, following the effective behaviors, masks or face coverings, social distancing, avoiding large groups, staying home when you're sick, but we're still seeing an uptick in cases, um, isn't enforcement the only thing we have left? Well, unfortunately, people are not following those social distancing requirements. Um, and we know that because when we do our case investigations, um, people tell us, oh, yeah, well, I did go to a graduation party and now 14 of my family members are sick. So it's probably that we got it there. And yes, that's the case. The timing is right. The situation is right. So we know that people aren't consistently following those requirements. Um, so it's, it, and part of it is public education because <clears throat> I might be doing it, you might be doing it, your neighbor may not be doing it, and we have to reach that person because that's a break in the ring of, of, uh, of uh, our protection. Exactly. <clears throat> um, we only have a few minutes left, so uh, the, uh, only a couple more questions we'll get to. Uh, uh, Kim asks, do we have enough doses of remdesivir? The answer is, uh, so far, yes, we have had sufficient, but it's probable that we won't in the, in the future. So this medication, it's not a cure for the virus, but in people who are very ill with it, it may be life-saving. So there's only certain circumstances where it's being used. Um, basically in intensive care um, settings with people on ventilators. And um, it's only made by one drug manufacturer, Gilead, over the hill in Santa Clara County. And our federal government purchased the entire stock of remdesivir for the coming months. So our global health partners aren't very happy with us. Um, but nevertheless, um, it is in the U.S. And then the federal government distributes it among the states based on hospital census. And then within the state of California, it's distributed to hospitals based on daily polling. And then sometimes there's swapping that goes along uh, within regions or across the state. Um, last week, Mendocino sent out a plea. We need 16 more doses of remdesivir, and it came to them through various uh, hospitals that had a little bit extra. As well, so, what, so what people are trying to take care of others. They are. During this time, and that's that's a good part. Well, we've gotten close to the end. I think it would be really helpful, uh, Dr. Noel, if you could just share, uh, since in about a week, we're going to be closing the, down some more things as required by the governor. Could you just share again what is actually going to be closed? What's closed now and then what's going to be closed um, a week from now? If so right remember. now, bars, pubs, and breweries are closed unless they serve full service meals. And then um, indoor dining is closed. Um, and um, what else? I've forgotten what else. I don't have the list in front of me. Um, indoor like museums, zoos, uh, movie theaters, family entertainment like bowling, the arcade, the indoor miniature golf at the boardwalk. Um, all of those things are closed. And, and then, then next week. Next week, it will be um, indoor activities at gyms and fitness centers, uh, religious and cultural gatherings, protests. All need these all need to move from indoors to outdoors. Personal services like tattoos, um, facials, massages, and then um, barber shops, hair salons, and indoor malls. So almost all that could be taking place outside. I think. Tattoo parlors you can't do outside or something. Yeah, especially because they said if it does move outdoors, it can be under an awning, but it can't have any walls. So it doesn't give you much privacy. So I don't imagine that facials, massages, and tattoos will move outside, but the rest of the services could to some extent. And then again, offices for non-essential businesses need to uh, move virtual again. 
Well, uh, Dr. Noel, I just want to express the appreciation uh, from my office and for the residents of Santa Cruz County. Uh, we are fortunate to have you as a leader uh, during these very difficult times, unusual times. And uh, our success has been directly related to your vision that you had early on, your early action really helped this uh, from becoming a, a problem place in the, in the early months of this and you helped lead the state uh, towards some really good practices. And now we are all challenged by following the advice that you give. Uh, but I think uh, we are very uh, lucky to have you um, as our health officer and I just want to express the appreciation of so many. Thank you. And thank you so much for your support and the support of the board overall and our county leadership. It's been um, a privilege to work with all of you. Well, uh, I just want to tell people that we'll, uh, I'll be back next week uh, with the superintendents of our local school system to talk about what school is going to look like in the fall and how they might be best be able to support their students uh, and how we, the community, can support our schools. And uh, with the following week, we'll be having the California Insurance Commissioner uh, to talk about fire insurance, what it means here in Santa Cruz. So look for that. And uh, again, if you want to get my newsletter, text Leopold to 22828, Leopold to 22828, uh, or check out my Facebook page. Thank you, Dr. Nolan. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you.